Hey, how are y'all? Um, this is a pretty long video. Um, it's a theory I've been working on for quite a while. It's a, a big brain, small brain um, lecture. It's a lecture. Um, I've been working on it so long now that I feel like I just have to put the information out there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from what I've written. And as I'm going along, I'm going to talk about what I've written. Because I'm having a real problem finishing this um, this this lecture. It's turned into a lecture. Um, I think it's really important for you to listen to this because it's going to explain so much of what the difficulties are that we're facing in internally and with the people that we're meeting every day. Um, it's, um, yeah, look, I'll just get straight into it. Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about a big brain, small brain theory I have been working on. Theories are never judged by how right or how wrong they are. They are only ever judged by how useful they are at explaining what we see in the world. I think this theory is especially useful at explaining why so many areas of dysfunction in our societies at the moment. Why there are so many areas of dysfunction in our societies at the moment. So what is the big brain and the small brain? The big brain is the frontal lobes. The big brain is the frontal lobes and it is most associated with voluntary action and voluntary thought processes such as reasoning, logic and debate. The big brain also controls the physical actions that require thought and consideration like threading a needle or playing sports. The small brain is called the amygdala and it is most associated with quick decision making and emotional responses. The amygdala are most famous for controlling the fight or flight response when we face a real or perceived threat. So the threat doesn't have to be real. It just has to be uh, perceived as real by the amygdala. So the amygdala allows us to access threats, to assess threats and make decisions quickly. Our amygdala form a strategy to deal effectively with that real or perceived threat based on the resources available. So if you see a man standing in front of you with a knife, you'll say, will I take on the man? Am I strong enough to take on that man and disarm him and disable him? Or will I jump over that wall there and, and run away? So that's what the amygdala is for. And it will, it will make that decision instantaneously. It is not an information storage device. It is a calculator, basically. It, it works out a strategy quickly and then off it goes. The strategy occurs. So the amygdala are larger in the female and sorry, the amygdala are larger in the male than in the female. And although the females are fully developed by the time they're 14, male amygdalas are fully developed by the age of 16. I believe we can explain why so many people are difficult to talk to nowadays by looking at what happens when the big brain thinkers try to debate and discuss topics with the small brain amygdala people. We are at a stage in our secure, comfortable Western societies where words trigger the amygdala in some small brain people. These people who talk about being triggered are what I call amygdala hostages. So this word trigger, what it is actually referring to is that it's a switching process over from the, from the frontal lobes back into the amygdala which is back here, or the small brain. So I'm going to try and use big brain and small brain. It's just easier. So the big brain is up here, and we use it for debate and discussion and all these conscious actions. But the amygdala is actually divided in two. It's either side of your brainstem at the rear of your, of your brain. And people have called it the small brain over the years. But when you live with, when you talk to these people with, um, who are used to using their amygdala all the time. So they perceive words as violence. You hear this stuff all the time now. Words are violence. Silence is violence. You're triggering me. You need to be more sensitive. What they're talking about is the amygdala. You need to use your amygdala is what they're saying. That's, you know, that's exactly what, literally what they mean. So this word sensitivity, it refers to emotion. So that's what the amygdala is used for. So you need to be more emotionally sensitive. You need, you're triggering me. They're telling you, you've caused, your words have caused my brain to switch from the frontal lobe into the small brain at the back. Okay? So that's what's actually going on. So they're admitting, when they say they're triggered, 
they're admitting that they're now using their small brain to think they're going to have this discussion using the small brain which is absolutely impossible to do it's just insane to think that you, that's why they look they sound insane because you know um, they're using their small brains the fact that human brains can be triggered to switch between the big brain frontal lobe thought process and the small brain amygdala thought process is especially useful feature for survival the triggering of the amygdala at the time of threat means we don't use our frontal lobes and we try to and, and try to debate with a man threatening us with a weapon the sight of the weapon is enough to trigger our small brain to take over the thought processes and we decide very quickly based on strategies available to us if we were going to run or we're going to fight oh it's jumped again sorry now uh, i believe that many people's amygdala have been hijacked by those that wish to oppress us they constantly stroke these people for emotional responses of the amygdala in order to keep them using their poor logic and hysterical responses so we're seeing it right now all over the world people are being stroked their emotions are being stroked by the media they've been coached by social media and the media and schools everywhere they go everybody is, taught, is told you need to use your emotions to think so these people for years now they have been uh, using their emotions to think or their amygdala to think and now what they've done with this um, um, pandemic is that they've taken these people who they trained for years to be emotional and they've put a threat in front of them that their amygdala perceives as real or their frontal lobe perceives as real it doesn't matter whether it's real or not if your frontal lobe perceives it as real you will switch over into the amygdala thought so now we have a large portion of the population of the planet has been terrorized by the media and our governments the who the un all of these social media people and even the people around them are terrorizing them into thinking about this pandemic using their amygdala and that's what we're witnessing everywhere we look now it's, it goes a lot deeper than that so this virtue signaling that has become so popular is is actually a, a defense mechanism so virtual signaling most often often occurs when a person perceives a threat to the dominant dogma and the small brain person feels the urge to signal that they are aligned with the dominant dogma for fear anyone would perceive them to support the idea that contradicts the dominant dogma so these people going around wearing their masks and washing their hands and doing all this stuff they're signaling virtue and we see it in in our colleges we see it in our day-to-day -day life that there's a dominant dogma or ideology around and when we begin to have with us big brain people when we try to have a reasonable rational discussion about this dogma or, or ideology the small brain person will chime in with a virtue signal and what has happened there is that the, they perceive your words on a particular topic as a threat to their worldview or potentially their ego so many people's ego would be based on their worldview certainly a virtue signaler's ego is based in their worldview so when you threaten that worldview or you assault that person's ego with information that doesn't um, fit their ideology or their dogma all of a sudden that person has to defend themselves they feel they swap over into their amygdala and they feel like that they have to defend themselves and one of the defenses is that well they, they feel like that if, if they continue in the discussion with you they're going to be excluded from whatever group be it a religious group or an ideologic group or a, a dominant um, um, political uh, group so they feel like they need to seek signal to everyone else in the group actually I have the the moralistic position on this and we don't need to discuss it so I'm going to interrupt this debate I'm going to interrupt this discussion and I'm going to prevent it from occurring by signaling virtue and, and we'll all swap over into our amygdala and we won't be able to use our frontal brains to have to have the discussion so our media does this to them and our politicians does this to them everywhere they look they're they're looking at people who are small brain people are looking at people who are stroking their emotion and driving them to hysteria and that's what we're living in now we were living in it before but it was it was demonstrably fake so 
So these would-be oppressors, they usurp the big brain system of government designed by our ancestors called republicanism and its constitutions around the world in order to take control of our nations. Our ancestors designed the republican system of government without knowing there was a distinct area of the brain responsible for logic and reason. So today, because of our knowledge of the brain and because of brain scans, we can categorically prove that republicanism is the best system of government precisely because we can see the area of the brain that republicanism activates, nurtures and develops. And we can see the area of the brain the lesser systems of government activate and develop. So our ancestors developed republicanism and they didn't realize that the power that they were harnessing was logic and reason. They, sorry, they realized that they were harnessing the power of logic and reason, but they didn't actually realize that it was a different part of the brain. Logic and reason occurs up here. And these lesser systems of government, dogmatic systems of government, they don't use the logic and reason part of the brain. They use the dogmatic part of the brain, which is the amygdala. They use, if you go against the dogma, you're a dead man. You'll get your head cut off. You'll be excluded from the group. You might lose a foot. You could end up being tortured in a jail. Uh, you'll be isolated from your society. So dogmatic systems of government tap into the fight or flight response that's in the amygdala or in the small brain. Whereas republicanism harnesses the power of logic and reason in the forebrain. And that's why we can demonstrate that republicanism is the best system of government. It nurtures the big brain thought process by providing a safe environment for people to debate and discuss, to contradict dogma, to say controversial things, to make mistakes and to be wrong without suffering disproportionate consequences. Republicanism allows scientists, philosophers, journalists, politicians and clergy to develop arguments and positions through rigorous debate over time without facing real threats to their lives, liberty or security. Republican does this by cherishing the rights of individuals to use their big brain logic and reason to debate and discuss facts and figures and to arrive at considered conclusions over time. So give me a second, I'm just going to light my cigarette because this is going to take a while lads, but I promise you you're going to understand more about the type of person that's been screeching at you in the street, that's been trying to isolate you from your community, that's been getting violent, causing riots, breaking property, uh, derailing conversations, derailing debates. This is why th that stuff happens. So just give me a moment. I'm having a cup of tea and a cigarette. So without the protection that republicanism provides, it gives us a safe space for debate. It allows us to discuss controversial topics by respecting our individual rights. Without that protection, our brains will be triggered into small brain thinking most of the time, and our state and culture will become controlled by the small brain, just like what happens in dogmatic countries. This use of big brain logic and reason, combined with having the rights of individuals enshrined in a constitution, provide us individual Republicans the luxury of peace, comfort and security, and highly to develop highly philosophical and moralistic positions. This security means that individuals can make mistakes without, dis without suffering disproportionate consequences, and it provides a basis for rigorous debate and discussion that arrive at the considered conclusions upon which all republics thrive. Republicanism allows philosophers, scientists, doctors, astronomers, journalists, politicians and clergy to debate, discuss without a threat to their lives or livelihoods. And this means that these discussions can be conducted in the frontal cortex, the big brain. So by protecting people's right to free speech and to have a debate and to say what they need to do, you can keep them in their big brain. You can keep them up here. They don't feel threatened. So they don't go back here into the amygdala. Up until recent times, that meant these discussions could be advanced without triggering the reactionary small brain thought process. When big brain thinking Republicans look at countries that are not republics, they do not. When big brain 
thinking Republicans look at other countries that are not republics and do not have the rights of individuals enshrined in constitutions. We often think of them as extreme or uncivilized. We big brain Republican thinkers have great difficulty understanding that countries based on dogma create societies that must use small brain thinking to function. We big brain Republican thinkers look at these countries and apply our big brain thinking to them when actually the only way to understand these places is to understand the small brain thought processes. So we, we big brain people, our, our republics are very safe places generally. We rarely face a real threat and we, we get the luxury, they give us a luxury of living our lives almost entirely in our, in our, in our frontal cortex. So we tend to look at every problem with our, with our frontal cortex. So we look at small brain countries. We look at countries, dogmatic countries, where they have to use their individuals in the country have to use their small brain to survive. Because if they contradict the dogma, the consequences can be very serious. So we look at these societies and we try to be big brain about it. But actually, we, in order to understand those societies, you have to understand how the amygdala functions and you have to acknowledge that that's what's actually happening so what we fail to see is that when a person is born raised and lives in a dogmatic country i don't know it might be some religion it could be uh, communism it could be you know um, a king you know the king is the king of the country and you have to love the king it's all dogma it's not logic and reason which is so it relies on dogma which is dominated by the small brain and that person becomes coached to suppress ideas and speech that would bring them into conflict with the dogmatic regime. So the person's brain becomes used to suppressing even thoughts which might lead to speech or actions that could cause a threat to their safety or security from the regime. So these dogmatic countries, if, if, if you say anything against them, you could lose your life. But that, that thing that you said, or you might say, that originates as a thought in your brain. So you, a person living in a dogmatic country has to be ca very careful what they think because it could cause them to say something that could get them killed. Okay, so they, they, they have to allow the, the small brain to be dominant. So when these people have thoughts to conflict with the dominant ideology, their brain triggers to prevent the big brain, their small brain triggers to prevent the big brain from saying or do something that would cause a threat to their security, freedom or life to be at risk. The person's brain becomes accustomed to allowing the small brain to dominate their thinking and the frontal lobes become next to redundant in the functioning of that individual's community interactions. When societies spend their existence living under that kind of pressure where expressing big brain thoughts could cause great suffering or even death, that society becomes dominated by small brain thinking. It's, it's, it's difficult, I know, but this is what's going on in the world, really. Or at least it's a, it's a very, um, you know, it's, it's a good metaphor for what's going on in the world, where we have big brain Republicans dealing with small brain dogmatic countries. Western countries often, often talk about integration of immigrants from small brain amygdala dominated dogmatic countries when what we should be talking about is how we can allow immigration, the terms on which we can allow immigration from small brain amygdala dominated countries. But instead what we're doing is we're bringing these dogmatic cultures into our republics and we're allowing them to ghettoize. This is really dangerous. This results in the amygdala dominated dogmatic culture's thought process becoming rooted in the big brain Republicans, republics and has the knock on effect of causing the natives to immigrate by causing higher taxes and lower working standard. So when you bring people from uh, amygdala small brain dominated country into your western big brain dominated country, then the western big brain people are forced to support these people who aren't able to keep up with the money making effort in our economies so they can't get jobs that that they can make loads of money in. they can't support their families because they're they go into work and they, and they become irate with somebody who's trying to have a discussion with them they can't you can't train them in a job because they feel like you're 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 talking down to them you're hurting their ego 
by by teaching someone you're, you're you're making that person feel like you're the dominant one and they're the, the lesser dominant one and the, the small brain dominated person will have a very negative reaction to that and they're just not able to fit in a lot of the time in our workplaces then that means that the big brain people have to be taxed more to pay, support them and that then means also that the big brain people who don't want to be taxed will leave the country i believe that this is an intentional act by oppressive globalist cabals in order to attack big brain republics and drive small brain emotional thinking in that republic's politics we see it all the time now our, our politicians and our media are constantly talking about emotion you can't get a weather forecast nowadays without emotion being brought into it this orange alert and yellow alert and all these oh there's going to be a big wind be careful you know there's a threat to your life you know it's all stroking your amygdala everything on the on the television now is stroking your amygdala all the time this is done so they bring in these small brain people they increase the, the burden on the big brain people the big brain people leave and the the, the small brain the big brain people that are left are more threatened by the small brain people that they've brought in so now you get a, a society that becomes more dominated by small brain thinking more and more dominated and it's an intentional act so that then in the politics they can appeal to emotion all the time and be successful they don't have to be rational and reasonable and logical because those people aren't dominant in the society anymore they're changing the nature of the thought processes of the people who are in who are in the population so this slick dressing the nice haircuts the, the um, porcelain skin and the, the plum way of talking it appeals to that emotion it appeals to the senses all the time then they come out themselves and their words are emotional even their tone of voice is appealing to emotion you know it's there's nothing arresting anymore in pol politics a, po a politician doesn't come out and, and tell you that you're wrong and you need to do it this way or you know that he doesn't go through a whole list of facts and figures and say we've assessed this and this and this and, and we're going to do that it, he comes out and he says well we have to do it because of some emotional reason it's always emotion and it's intentional so i keep going uh when we allow big brain and small brain com cultures to come together in our countries under anything other than true republicanism that enshrines the rights of individuals, then we are condemning our republics. Because the small brain people will always dominate through violence and intimidation the big brain people who will be stuck debating and discussing while their numbers are dwindling through violence, rape, murder and chaos that is so prevalent in their small brain cultures and we're seeing it all over Europe we're seeing it in America the small brain people are being elevated their their uh, violence rape and murder and chaos has been covered up and been justified and they're they're being uh, elevated on television as being misunderstood and unexplained and oppressed and that you're it's constantly bringing up this the small brain thinking in people in the, in the amygdala hostages these people are amygdala hostages they, they have no way out of the small brain thinking because every source of information they have continuously strokes their amygdala so i'm going to move on a bit to how our lives in ireland and it's true around the world it's true around uh, western worlds this, this applies to all the western countries and to the youth of the western countries and i want to explain how it's causing so much suicide in our countries so you can see I'm not trying to uh, stroke your amygdala here. I'm, I'm showing you my faults. I'm showing you the true, the truth. I'm smoking. I'm drinking tea. I'm not trying to appeal to your emotion. I'm trying to get you to stay up here in your forebrain. I'm trying to show you that you, you, when you engage these small brain people, they're going to immediately try and insult you, or they're going to try and ignore you. So it, it, this is the fight or flight response they're going to ignoring you is the same as running away we call it cognitive dissonance so are they try and shut you down say oh look i don't want to talk about that topic oh look at you stop talking about that or uh, oh you're a racist or you're a homophobe or you're a sexist or they actually get violent they go mm, they to get this really intimidating look on them shut up you you know this kind of talk out of them or they actually get physically violent and, and 
I don't know what they've been doing. You see it more in the other countries, but they do it here too. They threaten violence all the time. And that's the fight or flight response of the amygdala. So you can't allow them to drag you down with them into your amygdala. So and that's a lot easier to do than it is to say than it is to do. But what I'm point, I hope that if you point out to this person, I hope that if you point out to this person that they're thinking with their small brain, that it might give them pause for thought. Don't tell them they're a fool. Don't call them names. That's that's you being defensive. That's you thinking with your small brain. No, I, I realize it's a lot harder to do than it is to say. And I've been trapped by it loads of times myself. Um, so what, what we, you, you need to get this person out of their small brain thinking, out of their emotionalism, and up into their forebrain, into their rationality and discussion. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing is you point out to them that their small brain thinking, that they're using their amygdala, and it is not appropriate for a, a complex philosophical discussion. That that part of their brain is designed to deal with real threats, like a tiger running down the hill, like a man with a gun. What it is not designed to do is to deal with speech and conversation. That occurs up here in the frontal brain. And if they're becoming emotional, if they're calling you names, if they're insulting you, if they're, if they're ignoring your information, if they're putting their hand up, this kind of thing, if, if they're being cognitively dissonant, these are all indications that they're thinking with their small brain. These are the small brain fight or flight reactions. Okay, so um, I, I get to how we how how we, we do this as well. And on our the big brain people, we do get trapped in our amygdala. I'll get to that in a while. So what I want to talk about now is what what our big brain thinking has uh, uh, has caused to happen in our societies. So this theory applies to how our lives in Ireland have changed so much since having more affluence in our society. We have become more secure and comfortable. This secure, comfortable living provided by republicanism means that many of our people's amygdala, small brain, have become less developed and are prime for hijacking. So the amygdala stops developing at 14 or 16. And if children haven't faced a significant threat or enough threats throughout their life, then at 16, they, they can't, they can't train their amygdala anymore, you know, and um, this is a major problem. So our Western lives become more secure and comfortable. We have a stable food supply, better access to shelter, better safety and security. This allowed our daily lives to become completely dominated by big brain thinking to the point where our amygdala are so underutilized they have become dysfunctional. We fail to see real threats and we imagine threats that do not exist. We no longer worry about people trying to kill us or where our next meal is coming from. Instead, many of our people's amygdala have been coached to considering reasonable discussion of identity politics, LGBT rights, gender politics, or racism as a threat to their existence. So, you've heard it, I, I mentioned it earlier. They've been coached to say words are violence, silence is violence. So, they're coaching them to, to use their amygdala when they come across reasonable discussion of the of the buzz topics you know identity politics or gender politics or racism or all this so if you if you try and say something that contradicts the dogma the dominant dogma in the media the dogma they use to stroke these people's emotions and to drive their uh, small brain thinking then they're coached to see that as an actual threat it's the same as you attacking them with a gun or a knife or something so they're they're trained this way yeah. these people so the fight or flight response in those people then is triggered not when a person faces a real threat to their lives, but when they perceive a threat to their worldview or their ego. And many people react violently when their dogmatic view is even discussed, let alone threatened. We see this all the time. Now, the violence could could be it may not be actual violence. It may be name calling, which is in nowadays what, they're, what the name calling is, is an attempt to isolate you from your society or from your community. So what they're doing is they're, they're, they, they may obviously feel like they can't physically dominate you 
or they feel like that physically dominating the person in that situation would look bad. So instead what they do is they call you a racist. And that is the same as, as, an, as a physical attack because what they're actually doing is they're saying if anybody else is friends with you, then they're a racist also. If your community gives you any support, then they're all racist and they're prime for uh, somebody else to come along and become violent with you. We've seen them just avoid violence based on, on these words. It's people trying to have give a lecture about conservatism or something like that. And they're, you have to punch the Nazi, punch the Nazi, kill the Nazi, stamp out the Nazi. So they're, they've been coached to believe that anybody having reasonable, rational discussion and developing these, these, these topics in a reasonable, rational way is actually a Nazi. And he's going to gas you or he's going to put you in the oven or he's going to Blake's Creek across the country. So they've been coached to think that these violent words are actually leading to a, a threat of, of serious violence. And um, they, they, this is why they react with the amygdala, amygdalic fight or flight response. Probably the most dramatic effect of our secure, comfortable Republican lifestyle has been on our children. The amygdala stops developing at the age of 16. We in the West have removed all danger and threats from our children's consciousness, with the result that our children's amygdala thought process are disastrously, disastrously underdeveloped. When I was a young man, I remember when I was young, not even a young man, when I was very young, I remember food shortages. I remember that we might lose our house. I remember it might be hard to heat the house. I remember getting into fist fights. I remember falling off of trees and off of roofs. I remember walking everywhere on dangerous roads with no footpaths. I remember getting hurt, playing sports and in the schoolyard. And I remember surviving all of those things. And surviving those things helped train my amygdala and develop it. So now as an adult, I can face most any threat without being stunned into inaction by a shortage of the resources of my amygdala. So I, you know, I, I can face anything. I really and truly I can face most threats in my life. I don't run away very often. Um, even when it's, it's um, you know, quite dangerous for me, I'm still able to think with my, my forebrain. So any fighting trainer, anybody who's trained a boxer, or anybody who's trained as in a box, in a boxing, a martial arts, or something like that, the trainer will always say to you, don't get angry. So you'll see the best fighters in the world in, 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 in MMA, in, in um, boxing, they don't get angry when they're fighting. There's a few that do, you know, they, they use their amygdala and they use pure brawn and aggression to win. But the most successful and the longest fighting men, the longest careers, they use their forebrain. So even though they're being physically attacked, they stay in their forebrain and they strategize about how to win the fight. Whereas if someone punches you or attacks you and you get angry, then you lose the forebrain control of strategy and you, you descend into anger. And because the amygdala isn't an information storage device, it doesn't have the resources to, to you know, use the, the things that you've learned over the years to, 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 um, uh, to win the fight. Now there is a thing with muscle training and all that with fighters. It's not strictly true, you know, but it's a good example. So in our desire to create as safe and secure as world as possible for our children, we have deprived them of the real dangerous threat that they need to develop their amygdala. You need to let your kids bang their heads. You need to them to see if they run too fast down the stairs, they're going to fall on their face. You need they need to experience um, danger and threat while they're young, while their amygdala is developing. So the hyper safe environment that we demand for our children, where we have replaced the real threats of daily life with fake threats of dogmatic contradictions, is actually child abuse. So we have taken all of the real threats out of our children's lives and we've replaced them with, oh, that guy's a Nazi or that guy's a racist or that guy's a sexist or that guy's a... And we've told these kids that that's what the threat is. We, ha we haven't told them that there's people out there who actually want to rob from them and hurt them and kidnap them and do awful things to them. We don't, we, we shelter them from all that. 
we would shelter them on the on the on the sports pitches or on the in the sports games we would shelter them from in our homes we make the home i'm not saying it shouldn't be banging people off tables and all that kind of stuff but there you can't be helicoptering parenting because it's actually child abuse they've only got a short period in their life where, where their amygdala is developing and if they don't get the knowledge they need in that period they will never have a, a sufficiently functioning amygdala um, the problem then what happens is that those kids will move out of the family home where everything was safe and everything was taken care of and then they go into the real world and they find that the real world actually contains real threats very serious dangerous things happen in the real world and they don't have the um, the small brain capacity to deal with these threats and i actually think that this poorly developed amygdala that's that many of our adolescents have is actually the cause of a lot of the suicide so they go out into the world and they face a threat and they don't know how to deal with it they try and even use their their forebrain to deal with the threat and that's just going to lead to a victimization so they go into work and there's a bully in work and they try and debate with the bully instead of giving them a slap in the mouth or, or, or instead of being bullying back you know giving as good as you get they try to be um, philosophical and debating with the person and that actually leads to more victimization because the, the bully himself he doesn't he doesn't he's thinking about his amygdala anyway so he, he's he's not appreciating the, the finer points of our adolescence debate and he the bullying continues and then the person the our adolescent goes home with their poor amygdala and their overly developed uh, forebrain and they, they 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 can't understand why they're they're being victimized and it leads to depression it leads to the turning on themselves and they start debating with themselves is it me what am i doing wrong i'm not understanding the person i'm not being sensitive enough they start blaming themselves when really if they had been thinking with their amygdala they would have given as good as they got you know so first of all the lack of skills uh, required to deal with threats will lead to more victimization so when the victim has time to think about the threat that they fail to defend themselves from they will use their overdeveloped big brains to process and analyze the situation and attach meanings and reasoning that do not help them deal with the victimization what they should be doing is press ups and chin ups and getting fit and strong but instead they're debating it you know so this repeated failure to correctly deal with threats will cause feelings of inadequacy self-hatred and depression this can lead to suicide but often will lead to but often will lead the underdeveloped adolescent to adopt one of one of the many victimhood ideologies that are offered by those that would undermine our republics so suicide is one result of, of uh, over underdeveloped amygdalas the other is that they become a victim and they identify with one of the victimhood ideologies that we, we see all the time oh i'm oppressed and the, i'm a fat person and they're calling me fat or i'm a skinny person and they're calling me skinny or i'm a tall person and they're calling you know so they, they adopt this whole ideology around their their victimhood that actually resulted from them having an inability to deal with bullies so our schools have have are one of the main sources of this problem so what the schools have done is they've made it nobody in the, none of the children in the schools are allowed to debate um racism or sexism or homophobia you're not allowed to say anything that doesn't uh, conform to the to the dogma so you have a situation in, in in the schools where where the kids actually feel safe that they're not they don't face these threats of racism uh, sexism homophobia they don't they feel like because no one is allowed to talk to them in school or they'll be kicked out of the school you know it'd be a big deal so they learn over why not to talk about these topics at all or just to conform with whatever the dogma is so in that instance they'll actually come forward into their forebrain inside the school and now the teachers can fill their forebrain with information and dogma they can program the kid because they don't actually allow any threats inside in the schools be it dogmatic or physical threat you know fighting in school geez i don't know what had happened to a kid now if they had a fist fight in school but the point being that they, they have created environments where people can go to be programmed 
they're, they're allowed to come forward into their forebrain. They've made the environment so safe that they're allowed to come forward into their forebrain. The information is put in their forebrain and then they're sent out the door into the real world and they swap back into their amygdala again. They swap back into their into their um, small brain because there's Nazis, racists, sexists and homophobes everywhere, right? The whole place, the whole country, the world is full of them. So they go, bring them into these safe environments, let them into their forebrain and, and, and then they program them and then they send them back out into the world, into the unsafe world, you know, the ideologically unsafe world. And they're all, well, I've got the information now, I just have to protect the information and not let anybody uh, contradict my worldview or threaten myself, my sense of self-worth through my ego. So actually this happened to me recently with a policeman. Um, so a lot of our police around the world even have are very egotistical so they're given a lot of power and they feel like it appeals to their ego so then when you stand up to the policeman and you say you know I, i'm asserting my rights here i require you to behave in the, the process that you've been taught all of a sudden that policeman's going hang on a second this guy isn't respecting my ego this guy isn't respecting my power you know so the citizen's point of view is that i'm i'm the citizen and you're the civil servant but the, the egotistical police officer, his point of view is that you're beneath him and he has the power. And if you attempt to, to speak truth to him or to assert your rights, then you're actually assaulting his ego. And he perceives it the same way as if you had taken a knife out or a gun out. And you see it all the time. They react viciously, as they did the other day. They begin shouting at me. They drag me off the bus. They, they put handcuffs on me, and they were twisting the handcuffs, causing real pain to me, you know? God, really, it was dehumanizing, you know? And I, I kept asking him, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And that's why he was doing it. Because his amygdala had taken over. His amygdala, he had kicked into a fight or flight, and he chose fight. He could have chose flight, but he chose fight. And that's what happened to me on that day. You can see that in another video on my channel there if you're looking for that. So this is also why you can have smart, dumb people and dumb, smart people. So we see all these smart people saying stupid things. And we see you could have an IQ of 80 and still be smart if you stay up here in your front brain. If you don't allow yourself to go into your amygdala. That's nowadays. So we meet lovely people all the time. And it's because they're not being run by their amygdala. They're being run by their forebrain. But we meet really smart people who have got really powerful jobs or big money jobs. You know, they could have an IQ of 140 and five degrees, but they're as dumb as a rock because they're using, they're, they're trapped. They're a hostage of their amygdala. They're stuck back here thinking with a part of the brain that doesn't store information. So that's why you can have smart, dumb people and dumb smart people so you know that this is this is why i'm saying this this big brain small brain thing this is this is what the the media and our governments have allowed they've they've realized that if you can keep people thinking with their small brain you've won it's easy it's it's so easy after that it's the people with the big brains that you have to push away it's the people who think with their forebrains. You have to do them down. They have to be gone. Because they'll argue with you. They'll call you out. They'll hold you to account. They'll, they'll debate with you and prove you that your policies are bad or your policies are wrong or your policies are harmful. But if you keep people, keep appealing to people's emotions and you keep driving hysteria and you keep driving fake threats, you will keep the person in their small brain. And the society is easy to control. It's very easy to control. They do it by wearing suits. They do it by looking well every day. They do it by appealing to your, your emotions and your, your feelings. This is, this is the proof that they're not out to help our society because they're appealing to emotion rather than logic and reason. So we have created a society of people who have underdeveloped small brain function and thus a very poor apprehension of threats and we have brought millions of immigrants from other countries with very highly developed small brain function who view our young people who have never experienced real hardship as weak and exploitable. They're laughing at us. They're laughing at us. 
Our people who have never faced violence or hardship now see words as violence and hardship and have become accustomed to having small brain emotional reactions to words. We see it all the time. Our people who have never faced hardship now see evidence that contradicts their worldview as a threat to their existence and their ego and they react with the fight or flight response. The flight response is called cognitive dissonance and the, the fight response can be insult or, or uh, actually physical violence. We Western Republicans try to engage in pragmatic discussions with people who see our words as violence and a threat to their existence and are surprised when they become violent or nasty or try to shut us out or by using name calling or deplatforming or inciting a mob against us to isolate us from our, the communities we share. So this is their tactic. This is all fight or flight. I know I mentioned it earlier on. Um, we Republicans have now fallen. We also know. So this is this is an important part for us. This is where we're fallen in, into small brain thinking. Us big brain people. So we've also fallen into the trap of using our big brains when we should be using our small brains and using our small brain when we should be using our big brain. For many years, we have been defending ourselves from these defunctional amygdala hostages. So for, for decades now, we, we completely deplatformed with these people. We were, the media doesn't stick up for the big brain people. It promotes the small brain people. The politicians don't stick up for the big brain people. They promote the, the small brain people because that's who they can control easily. So we big brain people have been have been on the defensive now for so long that we've actually be conditioned to not draw fire from the small brain people. We've actually adopted. We know how to deal with small brain people. Don't trigger them. Don't set them off. Because if you do, then they'll either get violent or they'll try and isolate you from your community through slander or smear. They try to get you cancelled. They try to get you put out of your work. So we've learned that the standards of judgment that these small brain people use and we avoid provoking their irrational responses. So we big brain people have adapted the habit of pointing out to each other when we anticipate that one of our actions, our thoughts, could be perceived by a small brain person as transgressing, as transgressing the small brainer's uh, standards of judgment. So we as big brain people now, we tell, we'll tell, we say to each other, Jesus, you better not say that now uh, because you, the other fellow will go nuts, you know. So we, we've adapted their their standards and we're applying it to each other so that we, we don't cause them to prov provoke a major reaction from the small brain media, the small brain government or the small brain people. And we, we're really good at it. We're really good at, at self-censoring. We're really good at saying, Jesus, don't, don't say that now. We, we talk about it later. You know, we, we, we change our behaviors. We have a different method of, of, of our behaviors in work. You know, we, 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 we go to a social event and we control ourselves around the small brain people because we don't, they'll mob us. They'll turn into, they'll incite other people against us. And we know that this will, this is going to happen. It's been happening for so long. So I'm appealing to you. You know, we have to not only call out small brain thinking, but we have to insist on big brain thinking. OK. My big brain, Repub many big brain Republicans operate in public and at work with these small brain standards and operate in private and by fake social media profiles. So we're not even allowed to have, be uh, on social media with big brain thinking anymore. We have to if, if our work saw us thinking with our big brains on social media, we could lose our jobs. You know, so many big brain people now have adopted fake social media profiles and, and they, they, that's all they can do um, to express their big brain thinking in social media. Um, I want to say to these people that we are facing the death of our way of life. And if we do not protect and enforce republicanism in our nations, it's over. It's over. We're allowing these people to regress our societies into small brain thinking like we done when we were in the caves, like we done, they done when they were in the jungles, like they done when they were out in the prairies, like when there was real threats to people's lives. We've replaced these real threats with social threats, fake social threats. There are no words that are going to cause you to lose your life. Words don't cause life loss. Actions cause life loss. 
preventing debate, preventing discussion will cause our republics to regress and they will cause our republics to arrive at any considered con conclusions and they will me it will mean that our laws and our politics are nuts, our small brain laws and politics. We have to stop them. And I actually think it's an when when a, a judge accepts a, a religious reason like for for a crime, oh, it's okay because um, his religion says he can do it. This is a weapon against republic. This is this is completely antithetical to republicanism. So when we accept excuses for bad behaviors based on cultural reasons or religious reasons or dogmatic reasons, that is actually a weapon to undermine the Republic. And I believe anybody accepting those excuses is guilty of treason. You're, you're allowing this weapon of small brain thinking to undermine the Republic. And I, I think there's cases to be made there. Facebook and social media re reinforce this kind of behavior. For example, when we interact with and share posts that suit the prevailing dogma, but we know better than to leave a like or share a post that contradict the dogma, you know. So us big brain people, we we're learning to uh, how to how to conform to the small brain thinking rather than calling it out, rather than um, um, insisting on big brain thinking. So we have to get used to this. We have to get used to identifying small brain thinking, telling the person, explaining to them, you're thinking with your emotional, you're thinking with your small brain. It's not appropriate for debate. It's not appropriate for discussion. It's not appropriate for the national airwaves. It's not appropriate for the, for the parliament. It's not appropriate for public representatives. It's a failure. It's a failure when you do that. When you use small brain thinking in a public office, you are betraying your office. There is no no other, there's no compromise on that, zero. Anything other than that is an undermining of the Republic. Our media and cultural institutions constantly use small brain emotional language to pro promote their dogmatic narratives of, of to promote the dogmatic narratives of our oppressors. So uh, these globalists and the communists and the emotional people are completely supported by our cultural institutions and our, 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 our media. So I, I'm coming to the end of the lecture. Um, I hope it, it uh, I hope when I look at this, I don't have to do it all again, but um, I'm, 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 I'm going to just give you a few small points that this is where I didn't finish it out very well. Our politicians constantly pander to dogmatic and small brain emotional thinking. They do, they're doing it intentionally. Even the, that bastion of logic and reason, which is the field of science, is now being do do dominated by dogmatic and emotional small brain thinking. This is a really bad indicator. We are a long way down the road to having a small brain, amygdalic society, a long way down the road. And that's where the genocide starts. It, that's where the genocide always starts, in small brain, egotistical thinking. These small brain people will only engage our points with their small brain. But when a professor of gender studies decides to lecture us, they use the fallacy of sophistry to pretend their dogmatic proselytizations are engaging the big brain frontal lobes. So what I'm saying there is that small brain people will only argue with us using their small brain. They start to insult us, they start to smear us, they threaten us, da 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 da. But when one of those, their guys comes out to give us a lecture, to, to tell us how it is, they use complicated and flowery language. They use, it's called sophistry, when a person sounds like they're being intelligent. So they, they, you'll hear them on the television and they're saying sentences and no one really, what does that mean? You know, there's nothing simple or easy to understand about their uh, logic uh, or their reasoning. And that's done to confuse you. So that you, it, it, it looks like it's forebrain thought, but actually it's done so that your forebrain is pre preoccupied, not with trying to figure out what they're actually saying, but trying to figure out their grammar and syntax. You're saying that these words don't even, you know, it's they're non sequiturs that they're using, you know. So there's a lot of these little tactics. I really hope there's other more qualified people out there that will develop this. I just need this stuff to be out there. 
Um, I can't hold on to it any longer. I can't work on it any longer. I've got too much other stuff to do. And I really would appreciate it if you would share this with people who are far more qualified than I. Um, and um, um, hopefully they can develop it somewhat. Look what they have done. So I go back to the lecture. Look what they have done with the China virus. They have stroked a motion and told people that the solution is to restrict personal freedom. Wear a mask. Stay at home. Isolate. Don't go to work. Don't socialize. Don't visit elderly relatives. Every solution they propose is a restriction on, on, on freedom. And by stroking the emotional responses, they keep people thinking with the illogical and emotional small brain. They keep them from using their big brain to think about this. They have a whole raft of people who are who are very experienced at using their amygdala for day-to-day -day interactions. So they train them for years in amygdala thought and emotional thinking. And now they've given them this perceived threat. And they're gone nuts. They're gone bananas. Wear your mask. They're, they're vicious about these things. These normally mild-mannered, uh, do-gooder, um, 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 virtue signaling types have turned into these hyper control freaks all of a sudden you know um real threat to their life this is a bit uh wandering uh we we have to stop this, this we have to stop this hijacking of the amygdala our republicanism is dead and oppression will once again control the entire planet the only thing that has ever defeated oppressive regimes is nationalism and the only governmental system that can sustain can sustain a nation is republicanism so that's it that's what i've been working on for months and i know there's books written on the topic um i think it's called the, the, the monkey paradox is one book or the chimpanzee paradox is another book and there's another friend of mine there he's a neurologist he actually sent me an article about it's in i'll try and find it and put it in the description um, but it's it's all about being an amygdala hostage and there are some indicators in it on how to deal with it um, not very many but um, it might help you uh, better understand what I've been trying to say here so those of you that stuck with me thanks very much and I look forward to a, a, a new future of, of forebrain thinking with you guys and don't be letting people make you emotional don't it's a weapon it's a weapon they provoke you, they needle you, they say silly things. So pick your battles. Stop having these small battles. I saw an article recently um, on, on this topic as well. There's no point in arguing with every small brain person you meet. It's just wasting your energy. It's wasting your time. You can't win. If they're going to stay in their small brain, there's nothing you can say to them that will change their mind. So stop having those arguments and stay in the forebrain. Have as many forebrain arguments as you like. Please do, it's great. But if the, if the, if the argument descends into name calling, insult, smear, threats, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time and it's drawing your energy out of you. And don't let them do that. We need your energy. We need every bit of you up here in the forebrain, okay? All right, even if you're in a physical fight, you still need to stay in your forebrain, you'll win, okay? Make the other person angry in, in a fight, and they'll lose. Trust me. All right, guys. Slaanish.